Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery Podcast. It's a place where we explore the world of horror in film, television, books, and popular culture. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the show. My name is Bruce Markison. As always, I'm joined by co-host and producer, Tracy Asteria. Tracy, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, Bruce. I'm looking forward to today, today's conversation. Very much so. How is everything with you? Well, I'm doing well. Normally, uh, we begin with uh, relatively trivial banter about uh, weather and other things, sometimes less trivial. But today, we're going to get right to our guest. We're both very excited to have with us our featured guest, a standout actor, Richard Samuel. Richard has starred in over 130 film and television projects. Uh, he has worked with directors like Quentin Tarantino on the 2009 film Inglorious Bastards, and also uh, worked with Guillermo del Toro in an outstanding TV series. Both Tracy and I are huge fans of it, The Strain, which ran from 2014 to 2017. And there, Richard Samble took on the epic role of Thomas Eichhorst. We're going to talk a lot about that. By the way, Richard was nominated for a Saturn Award for that role. Uh, very deserving of that. A few of other Richard's works uh, include Casino Royale, which came out in 2006. Also, another horror TV series, The Head, and he has numerous, multiple upcoming projects. Very glad to have with us Richard Samuel. Richard, welcome to the Ghostly Gallery. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Just came out from a wonderful afternoon with a lot of sun outdoors. And I'm so happy to be here. I feel so welcomed by you both. And I congratulate you for the quality of your podcast. Well, we appreciate wow. that very much. Uh, for those not aware, you were born in Germany. You grew up there. And, and I wanted to begin by asking about growing up uh, in Germany and how old you were when you really first became interested in film. At what age did that become an interest for you? Oh, film was so far away that uh, 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 it, it was actually an accident while I already was... Uh, an actor for a couple of years. A film was such a big dream that I did not consider I would have access to it. Being born and then raised, uh, I mean, I was born in Heidelberg, which is quite a big city, but I basically was raised 50, 60 kilometers for, uh, further away. So uh, really countryside, Bavarian, small villages, and the best you can get there when you stay there is become... Uh, the, the owner of a gas station or the director of the local bank. So th that's it. You know, that's the career you can dream of. So uh, my studies, my or artistic studies, then took me away from that place into big cities because that those that's where the universities are, and uh, um, and from there, then it took off, and I had an actor's career in theater starting in Germany. But then what I did there did not really please me. And then I got a scholarship in France, south of France. And then I made, I started my career as a theater actor uh, in France. And then I, I got a call from an Italian act, a, a big director, theater director. So I went to Italy and stayed there for 10 years. It turned out that, that uh, theater really was, was the good thing to do. And in my spare time in Italy, I... Uh, there was a thing I always heard about was was method acting and actor studio and all those beautiful actors I, I admired. They mostly came either from Stella Adler or method acting or Meissner or you, you name it. And turned out that um, uh, Susan Strasberg was doing uh, an actor's uh, uh, studio class, a master class. So I... I it, took the audition and she took me on and I had a month uh, class of, of method acting and she was fond of my work. And two months after that, I had the leading role in, in, in a first feature movie. It was kind of a dream, dream thing, you know, and I didn't consider really to be in the movies because I, I thought it wouldn't fit me. And my passion at that time was, was, was theater, you know, so, yeah, and I, I guess it's a good thing when you start in that business to 
to have a certain distance to it. I mean, in my case, it turned out to be the right thing. Susan Strasberg, that's a major name in the industry. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, I was lucky. I mean, she was fond of my work. And I must say, I had a real epiphany with that work. You know, I come from a theater where you, uh, you, 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 all what you, you are, are teached and trained on is uh, it, it show you the exuberance uh, of your skills. You show off or you show it, you know. And with the method acting, uh, I, I discovered the the beauty of of what I am is actually enough. I I already exist, and that's enough. I mean, I was so smashed by that discovery. The the only thing is that you do not even even need to show it. You just need to have something. So just be alive. And and don't try to convince others that you are, because in normal life you don't either, you know. And and this 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 it was very complimentary for me. And from that day on, from that discovery on, I made my my professional career between theater and 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 movies uh, uh it was a creative growing ongoing process and, and i'm still in it you know uh i do i do both i mean i do theater i do do feature movies i do i do uh, uh television uh, uh i worked uh, as a dancer for a while because i'm very much fond of 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 body work you know so I'm a quite a kind of physical actor so yeah, that was very late then. So it was ten years after I've I have been already a professional theater actor that cinema opened its doors for me. Oh my goodness! Um, when you were growing up, did you have any um, mentors or anybody that greatly influenced your life that inspired you to go into theater? I had. There also a, a, a very impactful moment. There was at my high school a regularly every year a professional theater group that would pass by and would uh, distribute the small roles in those plays. They would offer to to some of us uh, who would dare to to take it on, you know. And I was one of those. So I played Brecht and Schiller and Goethe, those German authors uh, in, in small roles. And I had a, a real epiphany with a, a real big moment uh, where I, I remember that I, I, I was, it was the the Caucasian circle from Bertolt Brecht. Uh, it's a Brecht uh, uh, piece. And I, I needed to play a drunken soldier who decapitated his enemy and then proud and drunken he would exhibit that that head in front of the audience and full of my hubris of being the winner you know having a monologue and so and all my comrades and also the teachers were so impressed by it and i had that was kind of the first time i had a thing that some thing emotionally very important uh, was going on there for me some some high tune uh, emotional transformational transcendental thing and ever since I, I was chasing that and that brought me into the business oh my gosh oh wow that's that's a huge moment uh thank you for sharing that story i'm a huge fan of the tv series the stream cool. um yeah, it's phenomenal. Don't do me then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, I was, I did not know that the TV series actually existed. Right, going off because I was such a fan of Del Toro's yeah. books that he he wrote with Chuck Hogan. Um, so you know, it's it's one of those. Believe it or not, I classify it as one of my comfort series that I, I like to watch, kind of over and over again. Um, Ooh. so. What what was it like bringing the role of Thomas Eichhorst to life? Like, what was that experience for you? Well, it was there again uh, one of the most important 
professional experiences in my life is without any doubt not only the result but the way we proceeded in this in this specific case i got a call from my agent that Guillermo del Toro would offer me uh, this part and it was true it was clear from the very beginning that this is an important uh, part of one of the the lead characters so i thought and Mm -mm. I said, yes, but, you know, you have to sign for seven years. I really would love to have a discussion with Guillermo, what he's looking for. Am I the right guy? So I was kind of full of doubts uh, as much as I was enthusiastic about it. So we started having calls and I would just, I would just kill him with questions and questions and questions so these monsters how are they and my doubts about you know i have played a lot of bad guys and what i really hate is to be just uh, we call that we call it the one who brings the soup to the others so you know <laughs> uh, 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 not an actor who actually has something to defend and to play out but he 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 makes the bad guy in order so that the hero can shine and I am. Um, I was since I discovered that work with with um, uh, Susan Strasberg and Francesca Di Savi and John Strasberg. So I did a lot of method acting. Uh, uh, I discovered how important truth truthfulness is. You know, it, it you need to 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 find an entrance into the character that you become its best lawyer. And that entrance sometimes specifically for bad guys is, is tricky to find psychopath or weird characters or whatever, because either you do, you are brutal and nobody un understands why. Then you bring the soup to the hero. I mean, so that he can shine, but nobody gives a shit about your make motivations, you know, but I gave, I give a lot of shit about the motivations of my character. So I needed to know how they work. In terms of organic and how they re reproduce and how they eat and how they defecate and how they fuck and 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 I knew that I was in good company because what I loved with Guillermo's work was that all those monsters. I mean, he's he's a monster nerd, but but what I got more out of it that those monsters, those creatures, I'd rather say, were like his babies, his kids. He treated them like, like his kids. He loved them. He had a real affection for them. And I wanted to get that affection for my character. So I needed to know. I needed to know. I was so eager about it that I really, I mean, I killed him with my, with my questionings. And later on, later on, when I was booked and we had kind of the first season behind us, I found, he never told me. Neither did Carlton Cuse, but I've, I, 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 I tumbled on, on, on a, a, a Comic Con in Texas where I wasn't able to go. And there was this discussion about uh, the different characters. And Guillermo del Toro and Carlton Cuse discussed how they took me on. And they said, so there was this German guy, we heard about him. So we gave him a call. And then uh, uh, I had a couple of calls with him, said Guillermo, and he just killed me with his 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 his, his questions, and he would, wanted to know everything, and he was so passionate about it that we knew we had the right guy. We had the right guy. So at that point, I I knew that when they offered me the job, it was not actually an offer; it was kind of a casting. And then, because I went so so immensely into the work, and I wanted to know where I can can have a hold on it, and then from there it developed. Of course, uh, 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 that was the reason why I, I I was taken on. And then the very first scene I had with uh, Citrachian, at the time it was it was a day it was a very strange day because. I don't know if, but you might know it, Tracy, that uh, Citrakian first was, was, was performed by John Hurt. Oh, really? You, hmm. Nobody knows? You know, Bruce? No, did not know that. John Hurt played Citrakian. 
but it was not very well. Hmm. And the very first day I had my first day of shooting with him, I saw John Hurt passing by and I wanted to greet him and I, he didn't even notice me. So he was kind of in a troubled mood. And that was the very day he left the set. Hmm. Oh my that goodness. was also, uh, perhaps it was two different days. Anyhow, on that set, specific set, it was the prison scene where is the, 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 the window, you know, he's in prison and I present myself to the policeman as his lawyer. And then we have this thing at the, uh, through the window shield uh, and we talk through, through phone, like do you do in, when you go, get a visit. And uh, so at that at that day, I also had my first scene with Citragen, and it turned out to be David Bradley. So I had John Ward and David Bradley at the same time, and uh, that was the day I, I got to know that it's going to be uh, 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 David Bradley. And we we didn't have any prep time in terms of togetherness. Each of us prepared the thing for himself. You know, we didn't run the lines together or whatever. Uh, we didn't, I can't even remember that we, we were presented to each other. They were, they were in deep trouble because of the change and because John Hurt left because he was ill and he died a couple of months later. Mm. You know? oh so there was this thing and there was just an immediate connection with David it was just there was just something going on and that that yeah. scene was the first thing we shot together and i remember that i was so happy about it because uh we might talk about that later i did specific things things for the preparation of that character that made it very risky for me. I didn't know if it would work. It means, I mean, basically the economy of expression. It's a very radical, very radical economy of expression. Uh, 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 and and uh, a stillness in him, you know. And it turned out that it worked with him because he is this incredible actor who has so much experience. What he needs is, is something to feed on. And what I gave him was my eyes and he immediately check, got it. And mm -hmm. so we had this connection with our eyes and that was the scene he's about, you know? And and uh, uh, I got a call from Carlton Cuse that they were very happy about uh, the first results and that they're gonna extend the, the 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 importance of the character. Oh my goodness! It's it. You did such an amazing performance of that character. It was. But I would amazing. also. I must say, you know, when <laughs> that that's one of those extraordinary things I have. I have this happening since quite some time. When I get to work with Americans, they give you the feeling, we hired you. And here, when you get hired in Europe, it's more, you're lucky that you got the job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're lucky when they get the job with Hollywood too. But that's what not, that's not the feeling they give you. What they give you is, we hired you because you are the best for the job. And we are convinced that you are going to you're going you're gonna to stun us every day. So it puts a huge pressure on you because expectations are very high. But turns out that I adore this kind of pressure. Means for me, I translated it, they are actually people who think that I, I, I am better than I think of myself. Perhaps they see something I am unable to see. So let's try to be up to their expectations. And then I just work my ass off. It just gives me, it just gives me this extra drive. You know, when it's like when people love you or it's like when people believe in you, it just, it just enhances your capacities. It, it gives you more energy. It gives, and then there's also this thing. I hardly 
anywhere else had this feeling as much as in the strain that I was not only the actor who plays Eichhorst, I always was with the head of department of costumes, head of department of of, of stunt coordinator, head of department of lights, uh, uh, makeup, whatever. And they treated me like head of department of the character of Eichhorst. So it was kind of nothing would be decided without my consent. And that gives you a, 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 a huge importance. And it gives you a huge power, but it gives you also I, 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 it gives you the awareness that you better don't misuse that power or that responsibility given to you. Use it wisely. Use it when really necessary. Then put your authority on the front line. Otherwise, be a good soldier, be a team player, you know. And there was this kind of thing that just turned out to be the right thing at the right moment with the right people and the right character. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Uh, the storyline that you had, I, I thought was amazing. And you truly played like one of my most favorite characters of that series. So thank you for your performance. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so you, you did touch a bit on the cast and the entire cast was phenomenal. I think each actor and actress, they brought such believability to the storyline. What was that chemistry like on set for you? Yeah, that was the other thing when you you are projected into a kind of family of which members are completely unknown to you. And you find out the very first day, I mean, you know you're going to spend four, five, six, seven years perhaps together. And uh, most of them are not from Toronto. So we're basically are on our own. And uh, hopefully we find each other interesting enough that we easily can hang out together in our spare time, you know. And yeah, that was right from the spot. There was, I mean, they just did an amazing job on on the casting. Because we were we were a family from the very beginning. The only one who was a little bit outside was Corey, but he was a becoming father, and he has mm. back and forth between uh, between his pregnant woman who was in New York. Yes, yeah, she was in New York. So they live in New York. So he was back and forth. So, but he 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 was a good team player, you know. But all the others who most, be, we also had way longer trips to do. I mean, even Kevin, he took with L8 six hours and all the Europeans, uh, they, they had six hours to London or like me, Paris. Uh, so you, you, most of your time, you, you stay in, 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 uh, in the base, which means Toronto, you know, and, and. I had a one hour flight, so it was easy for him to weekends to go to go back, you know. Uh, but, but yeah, this 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 thing is, is magic. It's it's it reminds me of a of a, of a saying I, I learned in. Actually, I do, didn't learn it. I actually invented it in theater. You do not you do not need to love each other to make a good work, but it is better. Mm -hmm. Better you love each other. You do not need to. It's better if you want to do have a if you want to be able to do good jobs, you know, because we love each other and generally work better together. And so most of, most of the shooting was it all done in? Yeah, most of the shooting were uh, Toronto was the base. I actually learned then also that that a lot of so called American movies are shot in Toronto, like they most, lots of them are shot in Vancouver. It, it's not all. Like like uh, uh, um, Hannibal was shot in 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 Toronto. Hmm. All the Guillermo del Toro movies have been shot. Uh, Pacific Rim and all these things, uh, uh, the, the 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 haunted house thing of of Guillermo, uh, uh, Shape of Water was actually shot in in the scenography of the strain. Hmm. Oh, really, I did not know yeah. that. Yes, if if you if you compare, you will see it at, at one uh, the the place where the tank is mm -hmm. is where the coffin of the master was at a certain point, and 
the the uh, the pregnancy station of uh, uh, Eichhorst uh, Machiavelli uh, maternity uh, facility is the police headquarters in the shape quarter. Yeah. Wow. It's exactly it's the same room actually with the staircase going up and then the the on the first floor the, the all all the windows looking down to the to the big uh, big uh, uh, big space. Oh it's, my gosh! Oh, that that's neat. So 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 yeah yeah yeah. So most most was shot in 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 Toronto and then the surroundings in Ontario, and uh, for every season. We condensed kind of two, three weeks shoot a shot in 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 New York to get establishing shots and to have some some scenes outdoors on the Harlem Bridge or whatever Bronx or 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 or, or the Twin uh, uh, Manhattan downtown or whatever you name it Hudson River so that it was easier to sell Toronto. It wasn't. It's not so difficult to sell Toronto for New York anyhow. Mm. You yeah. see an end tower, and you put a Statue of Liberty in one of those on one of those islands, and you're done already, basically. You know, but but uh, in order to pop it up, they had two three weeks shooting in 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 in, in New York, and that enabled them uh, easily to 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 sell to sell Toronto for New York. Richard, you mentioned some of these great cast members that you've worked with, David Bradley, Corey Stoll, Kevin Durand, yes. also Ruta Gedmintas. Yes. I'm curious, have you remained friends? Have you remained in touch with any? Yes, of yes, we have. So we're. Uh, that's the good thing about social media. So with Kevin, I'm ever since connected through Instagram and we, 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 uh, we send us greetings, and when I'm in LA, I catch up with him. Uh, 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 I was recently shooting in in uh, London for five months, and I met Ruta. She's a double mother now, and mm. so yes, whenever we get a, a chance, we, we 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 try to connect. You know, there is it's kind of a thing. You know, you this is this is a, a business. Where you meet so many extraordinary people, you can't be intimate friends with everybody. But the fact is that there is a natural selection, anyhow, that you can catch up a uh, contact left for years just where you have left it, and it, it reignites immediately. And I have a little bit the feeling. With with my with my uh, comrades uh, on, on the strains on the strain because it was kind of a yeah it was kind of a battlefield it was very hard conditions you know uh, just to 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 make to make you remember or, or that this was night shots during winter time in Ontario and yeah. uh, vampires are supposed to be insensitive to cold so so that I did I did not even have what human those who play humans had the big, big stuff to, to cover themselves from the cold. No, I had my Ralph Lauren suit and I had to fit that I, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt at all, you know? So, and that's, that, that's the mix. Yeah. That, that's how you bond, you know, when you, you, you go through war and you survive and, and, and that's how you, you become lifetime friends, you know? Oh, that's amazing. And I can only imagine shooting in Toronto. I live in Nova Scotia and yeah. it, it gets cold here in the winter. Like, very you know cold. what it is? Spend some winter time in Ontario. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about. Exactly. Um, so again, there were so many special effects in, in that TV series. Um, you had one of one of the first scenes that was pretty iconic is when you were doing, you know, transforming into a human from the Strigoi in the mirror. Um, what was it like seeing yourself transformed like that into such a character? Uh, that's that was actually a beautiful moment because I hardly, hardly, I mean, I think not even once per season, I got to see myself. Yeah, once per season, every every ten episodes, I got to see myself as the vampire that I am, that uh, I really am, you know. 
for for that scene, actually, we really expose it. Like we expose it in in my breakfast special breakfast room with a chained uh, human uh, whom I suck dry for 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 breakfast. You know, uh, that's, that's right. the, so. Those scenes are. I actually got photos from those scenes and from those and and videos from from the, the makeup in order to remind myself who. I really am in order to to get this animalistic thing that estranges you a little bit from human behavior, you know? And uh, so, yeah. So first of all, this very, uh, this scene was really shot by Guillermo del Toro. So he came in and he took mm. care of that thing because Officially, he only directed the first episode, the very first, and then he was kind of the archangel who supervised it all and visited, got to see all all the rushes and that stuff. But he moved in also as a firework whenever we were in trouble because something wouldn't work. Uh, he would move in, and with two, three, bump, 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 zack, all of a sudden you had a magical scene. It was amazing. And for this specific thing, uh, I was worried because you, you must you must know that um, uh, quality needs time, and you have lo- lots of work, and and then you know how the the the, the, the system works. You have these these uh, um, directors coming in, and they have a certain amount of work to do in a certain amount of time, and not go over budget. So the main focus is get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> is that you collide with uh, uh, the particular care every once in a while. Things need a particular care if you want to pop it up. And I, I would say it's not so much an ego trip uh, because at that point I already was really head of department. So I really got the picture of what the project is about. And the, the, the main character is actually the story we tell. It's not the, his that character or that character or that character. Fact is that there are certain things who are really important, and that's you can't just throw throw it like that a scene like that. And then uh, Miles gave me a huge smile, and Miles Miles Dale, the producer. I'm uh, I'm in contact with him. I I, I had a, 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 a lunch with him last year in Toronto. I went to Toronto visiting some friends and and. We hang out together with his, with him and his 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 his, his wife, and, and it was beautiful. And he gave him a big smile, and he said, "Go, yeah, we'll take care. We'll do that with you." And so I, I was completely ah, yes, great. Oh Richard, my gosh! I have to ask you about another special effect. You weren't in the scene, but it was season one, and it's when they're doing the autopsy. Corey Stoll and Sean Astin are doing the autopsy on, I believe it's a general. It's a military officer yes. who they they don't realize how extensive the transformation is. And they start pulling out the tongue. Yes. And it just keeps coming out. Now, I've been watching horror for most of my 59 years, at, at, at least from an age when I was allowed to watch this sort of thing. So I'm kind of desensitized to this. But that scene almost made me lose it completely. Do you remember that scene? Of course I remember that scene. <laughs> I have no idea how many hours I spent discussing on the biological transformation from a human to a vampire just because of that incredible tongue. <laughs> because you have... I mean, it was like eight feet long. It was unbelievable. Yes, but you have to connect it with another scene. You remember the character of Bolivar, the rock star? Yeah. Yes, and at a certain point, 
he starts to transform and people do not realize it because he's already in his gore outfit. And uh, so he, at a certain point, goes to the toilet and his genitals fall off. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they just fall off. And that's actually the, the, that's the, 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 the first part of the transformation. You, uh, you, your genitals retrocede and then fall off like a dead flesh. And it all builds up again inside, but it desexualizes and it becomes a, a prolongation of the mouth, basically. It's uh, so it's it's interesting because it has a huge sexual symbolic effect. It has also integrated the threat of alien, who where I guess I guess it was the first time we see a big skull opening with the teeth, and then a smaller smaller mouth coming out again with teeth. And there was already this extension thing going on. But here it was was due to uh, uh, actual uh, transformation of a human into a vampire with no very visible changes, if not that hair falls out and then the skin is is disgusting, you know? Yeah. So I, I guess the surprise there, if there would have been aliens anyhow and a thing like that would come out, the surprise wouldn't have been as, as 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 big as in this case, you know. But yeah, yeah, that that was a huge moment for me. But I knew that it would come out because I knew at that point how we are made. And and uh, yeah, if they had ever needed an alternate title for the show, they could have called it the tongue. The tongue, it yes, been, it would have been just in as ho- accurate. Oh, homage to the thing. Yes, oh, that's yes. right. <laughs> For those who haven't seen the show, and we all highly recommend it, it it did run for four seasons, 2014 to 2017. I believe it was originally on the FX channel, but it can now be seen on Hulu. So if you've got Hulu and you have some time to watch it, it's terrific. It holds the story and it holds the audience for four seasons, quality seasons. And obviously, Richard is a huge part of it with his uh, dastardly character of Thomas Eichhorst. Richard, I do want to talk about some of your other work as well. 2020, you did a show called The Head, Mm -hmm. which I have to admit, I have not yet seen, although I've heard good things about it. I believe it's about global warming. It's, It's got horror elements to it. Tell us about your role in that show, The Head. Well, it's, I don't think it's about global warming. It's a, 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 a scientific station in the Antarctic where you have the uh, daylight uh, working month. You have one team, and then you have uh, uh, the night, the long night of six months where you have another team moving in and uh, 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 relaying with uh, the other scientifics. So we're all scientifics or engineers or a cook or whatever. So we have a group of 10 people who are staying there. It's a minimum reduced team in order to make that station survive and to do some research and some, some lab work and, you know, and, you know, just keeping the the thing alive. So we relay uh, the the sun team. They all move away, and then we are closed in that uh, uh, laboratory in the midst of the ice. And then the murder happens, and the first thing you see is a dead head. Uh, I mean, a, 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 a severed head. Lying, and then you find out that it's the communication guy trying to, and of course, nobody else being there. It must be one of us. Mm. And then it's basically, yeah, it's basically. I don't know if you have that in America. There is this 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 rhyme thing. Uh, there are ten people, blah blah blah, da, 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 and then one fell off, and that's only nine. And then nine people, da, 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 and then one dies, and then it's only t- eight. And it goes on like that, with with uh, the climax getting closer to the more dead people there are, the more suspicious are the survivors, you know, because in numbers they are reduced. And there are elements also that 
that there might be outside forces having done that. So it plays a lot with all the uh, tensions and fears and expectations you have in a in a, in a claustrophobic uh, s- s- space out of which you can't ex- escape, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's the thing. And it it turned out to be to be uh, way way better than I feared it would be, because my my my, my biggest concern were the um, uh, shooting conditions. So me. At that point, being a real fan of method acting, you see, you think, yeah, you do this thing in the big ice. Of course, you go to Iceland or you go to some place where you have enough snow so that you're covered from that side. Fuck no. We went to Terenirufa in the Canary Islands where they shot uh, Robinson Crusoe, Christopher Columbus. In, in the midst of, of, of the rainforest and blah, blah, blah. In studio, we had fake snow. We sweat our asses off. It was in July, August. I mean, uh, temperature hit records. And, and, and uh, I mean, you know, so it was all fake. And we had to fake the cold while we were dying of, 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 of too high temperatures, you know? Yeah. So, of, of course, inside station it was was studio and then of course it, the, here you you're okay but actually a lot of stuff happens outside you know the garages and then the, lots of killing happen outside or when you try to repair a thing you have to go outside and when you want to be alone with the love scene you go outside so there were actually a lot of stuff happening outside and um, we had a, we had different studios and there were not uh, there was no uh, 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 air condition. So instead of 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 um, hot boiling heat pads, we had these 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 batteries of ice cold stuff. that were uh, coming from 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 uh, from the freezer, and we had them like you know all this ammunition thing normally from the soldiers. We had these ice pads on our bodies inside our our parkas, you know. American Goose uh, 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 thing, and we were changing four times our our our, our clothing's because they were just sweat full of full of sweated water, you know. Uh, it was so that was the condition. Hopefully, then, but but no, let's say, was was really good is that the suffering of the sweat credited the su- would 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 be. Would, Credited to the suffering of the cold, it, it read like that in the in the end uh, uh, thing. And then a huge compliment to the special effects because when you start see the opening scene is kind of, of amazing. Just because you have you seen the trailer, Bruce? I have not. So you just have a look at the trailer, and it's all uh, uh, it's all a special effect. All, the, all the, the the establishing shots from when he close in with with the helicopter or or, or the planes, and it looks amazing, very very believable. So I said, "Oh, we are on the good side here," and it had, yeah. it had uh, quite some 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 uh, quite some success because they're now shooting. Ever since they've made they've done season two, and now they're actually shooting season three. And uh, uh, so it means it goes on, and when it goes on, generally it's because it's good. Oh, it yeah. makes money, and people who watch it want to want to want to watch more. So, good sign. And here, a very different character for you. Sounds like you're one of the innocent victims, or potentially innocent victim. So this is other end of the spectrum from the strain. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not very difficult to be on another spectrum because I, I haven't played very, very much many many vampires. You know, when you play vampire, and you play a taxi driver, or you play a, a barman, or you play a, a lawyer, or it's all very very far away from a vampire. Vampire who's 120 years old, you know. So, so here I was, the head of the station of of, of the night of of the the winter team, 
and and then I had a love love affair uh, with one of of the female uh, staff, and it was a hidden love affair because officially she is with somebody else, and so it was these kind of complications, and yeah. But it, it was it was nice to shoot that because um, it has it had a quality. I mean, the suspense thing was more of a movie thing, but the fact that it was in one space uh, connected me with my experience of a theater play. You know, hmm. one of the most famous films that you've done, not a horror film, a uh, really terrific film from two thousand nine. In Glorious Bastards, you have a memorable kind of a showdown scene with Brad Pitt where he's interrogating you. And there you had a chance to work for a pretty famous guy, Quentin Tarantino. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that experience. I don't know. You pick out all those uh, most iconic uh, things that happened in my professional life. So I've told this a lot, but I try to make it short. I was going for the for the lead role and I wasn't taken. Because Quentin was looking for an unknown but very solid German actor who play who who speaks a lot of languages and uh, who is not yet a huge star but very solid. So there were not so many who would be able to be considered. So I didn't get it, and as he just said, so uh, 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 there is a dangerosity coming out of my pores that was not right for the character. Anyhow, he found the right guy, as we all know, because it's not by chance that Christoph got the Oscar. So anyhow, Quentin offered me that other character, and I said no, because I was too disappointed. I said, I can't take that because I have the impression to give me a lollipop if not to cry. I, I don't want a consolation. I, what I need is a motivation to do that character. Otherwise, I can't do it. And 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 uh, I wouldn't be fully there. And he said, "Okay, I understand. How much time do you need?" I said, "What? Yeah, how much time do you need to overcome your uh, deception?" I said, "I don't know. Uh, three weeks." Three weeks later, he called me back, brought me back to Berlin, and he spent half of a day only with me explaining me in all detail the whole movie. And I actually knew all the text of, of Hans Lander. He knew all the text anyhow because he wrote it. So we were playing like two kids, cowboy and Indian, in his office on our knees and playing and they'd make a uh, big von Donnersmark and I played the, the, he played the female and I played Landa and, and then and then t- comes also to, to the scene and then he said, you see, you, you, you need to be. He said, "You are my Jimmy Van Cleef. You must do it. Please do it." So he was big and kind of. It was incredible how much, how much effort and and motivation he put into convincing me to do it. I mean, it was kind of completely unreal. He there was this Oscarized, super potent, powerful. Uh, star who was trying to convince an unknown actor to do his part and and of course I, I, I said of course I do it because I was so and then later on I, dis- I discovered that he has done this for a lot of other actors who were because a lot of German stars are playing in that movie mm-hmm. and all of which all of whom have little to play, so to say. He convinced them all. Hmm. I mean, some, I guess, just because, I don't know if all had these these hesitations like I had. I was going for the big thing. I didn't get it. So I had kind of, uh, he, he, the fact is that he understood the process of what I was going through and that flabbergasted me. It was just astonishing. And then he said, you don't need a lead. You need one unforgettable scene in order that people remember you and wait and see. Well, he gave it to me. Then, you know, I don't know if you know how much time normally you need to shoot a scene like that. In normal production terms, you would need two days to shoot a thing like that. We shot it seven days. 
seven days. He shot six days in a row. And then two months later, he brought me back for one day just to get you. You remember when I sit there very immobile and then the, the, the comes forward, pushes on my, my, my face. Just that for the whole day. Just for that, he brought me back. You know, it was, was, yeah. No, it was, it was a real, mm, it's like, that's what I discovered actually. The real stars are so good because when you work with them, you forget that they are stars. They are just enthusiastic, incredible artists who want to work. And want to do a thing. Let's do, let's play. Let's do a thing. Let's do a thing we're all proud of. Let's make this. Let's, how, if we couldn't do that and that and that. Oh, oh, I have an idea. Oh, you have it. Oh, tell me your idea. So it becomes very, very boyish in a very positive sense, you know? And I remember, I remember that, you know, at that time I had guts enough already just to follow my guts. That's actually a recommendation I could give to anybody in this world follow your guts and at, at a certain point we were discussing a tricky thing brad pitt me eli roth quentin rehearsals and it didn't work out when when eli came out and whatever and and, and there was so many f so much fuss around us and and i was asking could could we just have five minutes just for us and Quentin realized, oh yeah, there was a little, little bit too much of of of, of, of uh, stuff going around. I say, hey, guys, please, please leave. In a second, two hundred fifty people left the whole play, the whole set. And so, <laughs> for the next twenty minutes, we were alone, and we just had a rehearsal, like in a theater play. You have a little rehearsal because you do a little scene, and then we figure it out. And then, all, when it was done, all good, all good. So very, very, very comprehensive, Quentin. Very sensitive, very tough, very, very right. I mean, I adore this guy. I mean, it's, what can I say? <laughs> yeah. Well, the scene came out great. Yeah. It was worth the time. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, my gosh. So do you have a... a preferred type of genre that you like to perform in like do you prefer drama or horror or comedy like is there something that just makes your heart really happy for performing what makes me happy when something extraordinary happens and that's generally by accident or because you have enough guts to risk stuff so I try to, and this becomes harder and harder because with experience, you get more cemented and surer and with your choices and you have structure and you apply uh, recipes and, and stuff and you have to escape that, you know? You really have to escape that. So so one of the paradigms I learned from, I, I worked a lot with, with uh, a coach, she's dead now, uh, peace to her soul, uh, uh, Geraldine Barron. She uh, was uh, uh, she was one of the star uh, students of Lee Strasberg, and she actually, when he died, took over as a teacher. She took over the actor studios at that time as a teacher. So she was also coaching Marilyn Monroe. She was so she was big time. Uh, big, big time. No, no, that was Susan, uh, Susan Strasberg. No, no, Geraldine Barron uh, coached a lot of uh, uh, younger actors. Anyhow, so she said, uh, 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 one thing, the first thing you, you, one thing is to surprise the audience. Another thing is to surprise yourself. And I thought once you get beyond the fact that you're good enough to keep an audience in awe or to keep them in your hand, it's not so interesting to place your effects in order to surprise them. What's way more interesting is to surprise yourself. And that's actually, it's actually one of those things uh, I applied really to the letter and that's what made my, my, um, my that's how I made my way through 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 Eichhorst because it was a very specific thing I needed to accomplish in order to 
to, to get this to the point. And so just to answer your, your question shortly, uh, no, I, I guess I get more offers as uh, for, for very intense characters because that's what's coming out of my energy. Uh, but I must say that I have uh, I've, I've grown up uh, with with comedy. I did a lot of comedy, the arts, clown work, and stuff. I did uh, theater, improvisational, improvisational theater uh, in the streets and and on stage. And uh, um, uh, and now I'm going back to to theater again. But it's all completely mixed up. It's I guess I get more reduced to very strong characters and not so funny. But I must say that I, I miss a lot making people laugh. And that's why I'm actually now engaged in a theater production where I do a... a, 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 um, a, a duo with, with a friend of mine where we, um, we we play a, a, a very famous uh, a theater play uh, that had quite some success here in France, and we'll see how that works out, you know. Oh, wow. Oh, oh that's the genre. Yeah, that's... I, know I, I, I know that I want to escape the genre I've played the most in. So, for example, just to give you an example, I'm done with all Nazi characters. I started... <laughs> With so 2017 was actually the magic year because uh, there was a very successful series in France, a French village. Mm -hmm. uh, that, by the way, came out also in in in, in the states, and uh, 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 they play one of the the, the main characters, uh, and it's during the occupation in France with with the Nazis and stuff. And at the same time, I shot uh, the strain. Where is, who, who has also a, 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 a backstory of, of uh, a, a Nazi, you know, a kind of a very convinced Nazi. And uh, 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 so 2000, two, 2017, that, that this was done. And from that moment on, I, I, I stopped uh, saying yes. There was one exception, but this is a thing I could not refuse but it was a teacher. He he was a teacher at a radio at a school where, where soldiers would learn how to use their radios, you know. So, but it was Sean Levy, you know, who made Stranger Things. Oh my god! It's the series with Mark Ruffalo and huge. Uh, what's the doctor? Doctor House name? Uh, uh, huge. Oh, huge Laurie, no? Oh, Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie. Uh, and the yeah. series called uh, All the Light You Cannot See. So I uh, had just a small appearance, but it was so nice to, 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 he called me and, and he offered me that I want to meet you. I want to work with you. So I had, I had an officer's costume to be the teacher or anything. But with that exception, I, I do not do any, any Nazi stuff anymore, just in order to not finish like that, you know, because I could. There is so many, so many things out there that got offered. Uh, I could, I could buy houses with all they offered me, <laughs> but I don't want to n buy houses with money I, I I earn as a Nazi, you know. So, I think there is more out there for me. And actually, now it turns out that it was right. If you get any downtime in in your personal life, is is there something that that you like to do just? kick back and relax and enjoy some time to Oh, yourself. you have no idea how good I am in doing nothing. <laughs> no, that's that's the other thing, you know. Of course, we are very busy, but um, that's once that's the visible side of, of my life. And in the private part you won't see me in 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 clubs you won't see me at the red carpet you won't see me fighting drunken guys i i avoid every anything that could me put me in any way on the paparazzi's in, in the paparazzi's interest i i am vegan i am a yogi i am meditating i am lots in nature uh i I, I live a very private, a very recluded life, 
because that's where I nourish myself. I guess um, that I, I, I a couple of couple of days ago I had I saw this documentary about uh, Danny De Lewis, uh, who uh, is known for being completely out of the picture. And every five or six years, he comes back and does Lincoln or whatever, and then gets an Oscar. And they ask him, why is it that you disappear and you don't accept more work? And he says, uh, I guess you, I, the only thing I can explain it, it's like in agriculture. You can't harvest from an acre if you want him to produce all the time. Hmm. If you have a good, If you have a good harvest, let the ground be in peace for a couple of years so that he can recover. And he said, because I don't have more to give. I don't want to give half or a, a 30%. I want to give it all. In order to, to be able to give it all, you have to have all. And that's up to you how you get to that point. And his way of doing that is to to vanish for three years making shoes in Italy or wine in, in Scotland or whatever, and then coming back when he thinks it is the right constellation for it, you know? And for me, it's a little bit like that. It, I, I, I am very busy, but only when I'm busy. But half of my time is the opposite. I have my kids, my friends, I'm climbing a lot. I do a lot of yoga. I'm reading a lot. I'm writing a lot. I... I Take care of myself, you know. I'm not in the showbiz at all. I'm not part of any group of any. All my friends have nothing to do with the showbiz. Nothing. Oh wow, that's wonderful life advice. Actually, I don't know. Yeah. What about for me, <laughs> <laughs> Richard? We have just a couple more questions before we let you go. We talked earlier about your background growing up in Germany. Yes. I'm curious about some of the famous German directors known for their work in horror. Uh, F.W. Murnau, who, of course, gave us the original Nosferatu. Uh, Werner Herzog, who directed the remake Nosferatu, The Vampire. Are you a particular fan of those directors and their work? Um, more of no, I would have loved to, to have known him. And Werner Herzog is one of my favorite German actors, just because he's one of those wild guns that he's kind of the German Tarantino in terms of daring, creating stuff that didn't exist. From him, I got this wonderful quote. Uh, it's in one of his books, you know. Uh, uh, if if you wait until you have the money in order to make the movie, you'll never make the movie. Just fucking start shooting. And that's how he did the thing in all in, in, in the Amazon, all his movies... Uh, with Kinski in the Amazon, uh, you know, it was suicide mission, but he just made it, he just, he just started. And then out of necessity or, or the urgency of the situation, you, you'll find a solution. Just be, just, just risk a bit more. I mean, we're here to, to try to do stuff that's, you know, that's why I love him so much. I mean, he is really, uh, he's very, uh, he's a very big icon for me. Werner Herzog, exactly him, yes. I mean, then look at that. I mean, that's a real artist. I mean, if just three three Werner Herzog things, try to put them together and you won't be able. You take Werner Herzog as the very composed uh, uh, Nosferatu movie with Kinski, okay? It's a beauty of a composed, very thought-through movie, you know, very balanced, and there is a concept, artistic concept. Then you take uh, uh, the, 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 the Anger of God, or I don't know the, the American title, uh, one of those Amazon, Amazonian movies with Kinski, uh, uh, one of those wild movies. And then, you, and then imagine he, him as the actor with one blind eye in, in a Mission Impossible movie. And and uh, was it Mission Impossible or what was it? He he plays in a Mission Impossible uh, with, with with Tom Cruise as an actor. Oh, yeah. really? Hmm. So very eclectic, very very versatile, very able to 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 change genre or sides or 
interrogating himself about the necessity or, or the wish to make a movie. Uh, it's one of those guys. He's I'm all, always ready to be surprised by him. And that's I love that about a, a director. Um, and just one more follow-up question for me is, um, I'm curious, you are multilingual. You're fluent in many languages. How difficult when you're when you're performing? Do you find it moving from different languages? Oh, it's very easy when you get paid for. <laughs> it's great motivation. <laughs> A huge motivation. No, well, actually, no. It's it's you know there is the thing called distanciation, which you, it's kind of the thing you need when you have the identification so strong. You also need disidentification in order to be able to evaluate the quality of what you're doing. And that actually happens when you perform in another language. I'm not talking about the, the, the problems of, of finding your words in order to, to, to express what you want to express. I'm talking about the fact that it's like Samuel Beckett. He said he, his best writings he did uh, while he was writing in French because he needed some supplementary effort in order to be able to define what he really wanted to say, you know? And uh, 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 I, I guess what I love so much about the... the, uh, the I, I was a musician before I became a, 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 an actor. I don't know if you know that. So languages for me are basically styles of music, different styles of music, you know? And if you switch to a style that you do not master so well, it puts you. it's also a way of putting you out of your comfort zone. While you're still able, you're more fragile. And you sometimes you, 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 you do some, you, you, you say stuff, you can't really say it like that. Like I, I'm sure I've done that here in that interview, but you find it charming. I'm sure it's not what I wanted to say. And... Uh, you say, oh, you speak a very, really good English, but it's not the real English I'm speaking. I just try to express stuff I feel. And with the words I have at my disposition, I try to, 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 to that the idea of it comes through, you know. And, and with your reactions, I see that, that I, actually, I actually am able to... to to, to, to pull it off in, in that sense, you know? So this discomfort, this, it's a creative discomfort that creates the change of language. And I like that. Well, you are absolutely phenomenal. Thank like, you. This, this is amazing. This has been such a great conversation. So what kind of projects do you have coming up? I noticed that you have several releases that are in post-production. Are, are you allowed to mention? Well, there is one very big thing I am not allowed to talk about, but it is a dream that came true. And you're going to hear about it in 2025. Oh. It was delayed through due to uh, uh, the strikes in, in the States. So post-production was a mess and stuff. So anyhow, so... So there is an NDA on it. And then I have a series we just uh, uh, are closing post-production now, editing now, and it's called Lex Africana. And it's a series produced by Canal Plus and Media Pro, which is a main actor in a, a, a series production in uh, Europe. Uh and uh, it's it's a story of a homecoming uh, a black student who made his fortune in 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 Asia as an architect coming back for the funerals for of his of his father, and then finding out there is something foul in his death, and he starts to investigate, and then he opens the, uh, I mean. Uh, political intrigues, corruption, and all the things you can imagine. So it becomes a spy, thriller, family story, a modern story of how our life goes here in, in, the, in, in the industrialized countries. 
and and the fact that it's no different in in in, in Africa or in Asia or wherever you go. So this is uh, Lex Africana, and then I finished in November um, a TV series for Net- Netflix, and it's called A Better Place, and it has a Ken Loach touch to it, and it's actually the uh, the fictional fictionalized version of a social experiment that happened really in the Scandinavian states. They freed all the prisoners and uh, supported them with mentors and 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 uh, an apartment everybody got an apartment a mentor and a job and in order to to find out if that would resocialize them easier and that the the percentage of the fall back uh, into uh, prison would then uh, decrease which actually it does so uh, but Society does not accept it because society wants bad guys to be punished and not helped. Problem is the punishment does not heal. Help does. And it's even cheaper. It's even cheaper to for the for, 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 for the taxpayers to help them, give them apartments. But what the normal guy in in, 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 in uh, does not know is that keeping them in prisons also costs taxpayers money. But they only see that it costs when you give them. Why should he be recompensated? Why giving him an apartment when he has done a robbery or whatever, you know? Uh, uh, so, so, and it's done in in a very interesting way. What I loved about it is that uh, there was not one character I wouldn't condemn, including mine, and there was not one character. Uh, uh, I would not defend at a certain point. Well done, I would say. And then two episodes later, what an asshole! And, and so, <laughs> so it's not. It, it's it's very and you're very pulled. It's it's a it's a yeah. Where 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 you put your judgment in 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 that? Is it right? Is it not right? Because mostly it works, but for some it doesn't. So do you? Do you free also pedophiles who have done their mm, yes, but not in my street because I have kids? No, or, or whatever. What do you do? Or, or rapists? Or, or it's very, very tricky. It's a social. It's a social dilemma. Well, the only thing we all agree about is that we have to change our our uh, our uh, penitentiary system. You know, because it doesn't work this, this way. So that's that's another thing. And 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 what else? Uh, uh, then there is theater coming up. I, I'm preparing a theater performance. It's um, that's actually a nice thing. Uh, just into words, uh, it's the first novel of Albert Camus, who's a Nobel, Nobel Prize winning uh, French author. He was a contemporary of Jean Paul Sartre, and uh, so we have the rights of his first novel. We adapted it to theater. I'm alone on stage for two hours. And we first bring it out in French in, in, in Switzerland and France. Next year, we are going to perform that same thing in German. And then next year, in 2026, we're going to do it in, 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 in England, in Eng- English version. And then we go to Italy, we're doing in the 27 in, in the Italian version. That's the idea. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. So, wow. So I keep myself busy. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Our guest has been the wonderful actor Richard Samuel, star of such shows as The Strain, The Head, but so many other great productions, both on television and in film. Richard, this has been great. We really appreciate you being with us and offering us so many tremendous insights over this past hour. Thanks so much for dedicating your time to me and inviting me. I was very happy. I thought that you were really interested in my answers. That's actually really good. Good point. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you. Our thanks to Richard. Our thanks also to uh, Tracy Hysteria. Tracy, really the one who set this uh, interview up and uh, carried the ball for us. Uh, Great job, Tracy. Also producing our program as well. Thank you to all the listeners to the program. We thank all of you for joining us in this Museum of the Macabre. And we hope that you'll join us again next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery.